Um, and so, um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. All right, good morning. Let me see if I can figure this thing out. Hang on a minute. Or not. Look at that. All right. Well, it is indeed a delight, a joy to be back in Belgium. Uh, the only place that I know of where if you just stay somewhere for one day, you can experience all four seasons. <clears throat> but therein makes it, makes it a challenge for us to know how to dress. I mean, my wife and I, we looked at the weather report for Ghent before we came over so we would know what clothes to bring with us. And so we kind of brought everything, which I'm glad that we did. But knowing the weather... Knowing the season that is bringing that weather becomes critical for us to know how to do something as simple as what clothes that we're going to put on. And yet, if we don't understand the particular season that we are in, be it in life or a season that God himself has changed, we don't really know how to properly do life together. Uh, I guess it was, I'm trying to think, it was last weekend, uh, one of my grandchildren, yes, we have four perfect grandchildren, all right? You have imperfect children that give you perfect grandchildren. This is, this is how it works. And so we had a birthday for our youngest grandchild, but it involved bicycling. And so we had a bike, we have bikes, and so we were riding around. And so that night, my wife and I were feeling different. We were feeling, oh, the camera. Ah, I need to stay on the stage. All right. <laughs> so we were feeling things that we had not felt in a while because we were not used to riding bikes. And we realized that, wow, we are in a different season of life. And so understanding that, it sort of helps us know how to prepare how to do life. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 says that God changes times and seasons. Jesus even speaking to his listeners. He said, you can figure out the weather. You can look in the skies and the heavens and figure that out, but you can't understand the times of the seasons of God. And in that encouragement, that admonition, that even that correction if you wish, he was encouraging his listeners you need to begin to look differently, not just with your natural eyes, but with your spiritual eyes, so that you don't miss the day of God's visitation. And I want to say to you that we are finding ourselves, and not just in the United States, but we are finding globally God beginning to move in a most unusual way that most of us have only heard about or maybe read about. But God is moving in unprecedented ways in this hour. Some people would use the word revival. Maybe you've heard that word. And whether it's revival to the church, whether it is an awakening to those that are yet to come into the church, it's a unique move of God's Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of talking about COVID. But... COVID becomes an important piece of this equation in that it was a prologue. What is a prologue? A prologue is an event that sets up another event. And what made COVID very, very unique is that it wasn't just restricted to one people or one nation. It affected the entire globe at the same time. Every one of us in this room, 2020, 2021, maybe even into 22, we were all affected, every one of us. Our stories are unique. Maybe you didn't get COVID, but maybe you knew someone that did. 
Maybe someone that you knew or heard about actually died from it. It had economic impacts. I mean, in the United States, we had this, <laughs> couldn't buy toilet paper. It was a big crisis in the United States, was hoarding toilet paper. I mean, Americans, I'm sorry, we're just idiots, all right. But it affected all of us in a certain way. But at the beginning of that pandemic, I, I really sensed that God spoke to me. He said, son, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this to open up, to plow up the nations and the church, to open up furrows whereby which the seed of the gospel and the reins of revival can flow through. And that's exactly what God did. And we're seeing the beginnings of something right now that, again, many of us have just wished for, prayed for. Let me show you a picture here. This first picture, ah, there's the screen. Let me see if we got the right one. It's a, yes. Maybe you've heard, some of you that are maybe students of church history, but in 1970, there was a revival at a little college in Wilmore, Kentucky in the United States called Asbury College. And this is known as the Asbury Revival. Some college students that were just in a required chapel service that just wanted more of God. They were just hanging out and they were hungry. My new definition of hangry is hanging and hungry. All right, not angry, but hangry. But they were hanging out wanting more of God. There was no big preacher. There was no great worship team. There was just hunger. And God fell. My wife's brother was actually a student at Asbury during this revival. So I actually have firsthand knowledge. But something unique happened 53 years later. Next picture. And you'll notice the same room, but you'll notice... Not only is it in color, but the haircuts are better. And the clothes are not nearly as strange. But the very same space in February of 23, roughly one year ago, God fell again. Same testimony. Students hanging out, wanting more of God. And thousands and thousands of Christians came to Wilmore, Kentucky to see what God was doing there. Dr. Craig Keener, who's written a book on miracles, was actually one of the speakers at our world conference in Africa this year. And my wife and I had an opportunity to engage him. We were sitting together there at the conference and talked to him about his experience at this revival. This was happening in February of 2023. We have a church planner in Denver, Colorado. And that church planner gave me a call on the phone, and he said, I realize many people are traveling to Wilmore, Kentucky. He said, but I don't want to go to Wilmore. I want Wilmore to come to Denver. I said, that's the greatest thing you've ever said. But we keep looking. The fall of this year, next picture, another school in Auburn University in Alabama, the coach the wife of a coach had a prophetic dream. She saw hundreds if not thousands of students coming to Christ. And that moment happened. And in the middle of the night, these students said, we have to be baptized now. And so people actually found this lake in the middle of campus. They turned their car headlights onto the lake so that they could have some visibility. And all of these students were baptized in that moment. This was in the fall of 2023. Next picture. This next picture is taken from Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida, the number two party school in the United States. This is where we want to go and, 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 and not get an education, but to just have a good time for four years. Hundreds of students, and I've heard anywhere from 700 to 2,000 students were baptized one evening in a fountain at Ta in Tallahassee, Florida, at Florida State University. Some of our campus ministers in the United States were involved in this particular outreach that saw that happen. Why am I showing you all of these pictures? Is that what was prophetic just a moment ago is now just reporting the news. Right here in Europe, 
Aoife Keegan, which some of you may or may not know, but she is our campus director for Every Nation. She oversees all of our campus ministries for Europe. My wife and I have the privilege of knowing her somewhat. And the last campus conference just two or three weeks ago, there were twice as many students at that conference as ever before. She told me at the end of last year she had never seen so many college students coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as she saw in 2023. So this is, while I'm showing you pictures from the United States, the place where I live, this is not just happening in the United States. This is happening around the world. God is moving in unprecedented ways in our generation. And yet, the begs a question, what does it look like and what do we do with it? Every one of us have an idea in our own minds. That when God really shows up, whether it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's in a small group meeting, whether it's in our own private time, when God shows up, what might be different in my life, around my life? We have certain specifications and expectations of how God is going to move. How many of you know that the core issue of life are our expectations? Come on. Every encounter that we have has with it an expectation. Whether you're just ordering coffee, whether or not you're greeting somebody on the street, whether it's an interaction with a husband and a wife, you have an expectation of how that encounter is going to go. And our life becomes a series of either met or unmet expectations. My wife and I will be married 46 years in May, all right? We've lived through many, many years of navigating expectations. I thought you, well, I thought you, well, that's not what, I, that's what you said. That's not what I said. 46 years of managing expectations. Come on. But we do it to God all the time. God, certainly this is what you're going to do. I mean, the disciples Here's Jesus doing all of these signs and wonders and miracles. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? They had certain expectations. People had expectations that when the Messiah would show up, he would come in a certain way. Certain groups of, of, of Hebrews believed he would come as a military leader. Others believed he would come in different forms. And yet he came in as a servant riding on a donkey. And as a result, many people missed him on the basis of what? Expectation. And when we come to any move of God, including revival, we bring those very same expectations. I asked a question to the leaders yesterday. I said, if revival cost us more instead of less, will we still call it revival? Once again, our expectations are God is going to do something in my marriage. He's going to do something with my children. More money, more health, whatever. We have these ideas, these ideals. Certainly, this is what God is going to do. But what if it doesn't happen the way that we think? What if even the history of revivals the Welsh Revival, First and Second Great Awakening, and whatever historically recorded revivals tell us, what if this one doesn't look exactly like those? Will we still ascribe it to being God? That becomes a great challenge for you and I. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we see the appearance of a man. The book of James says he's a man just like you and I. I, I. I understand what James was saying, but I'm not sure that Elijah, I'm anything like Elijah. Because we see Elijah showing up there in the Bible in 1 Kings, again, chapter 17. And the first thing Elijah is doing is cutting off the rain. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been able to influence weather. Hello? All I can do is react to it. It's raining, I need an umbrella. 
But here is this man showing up, and he's declaring a curse on Israel. It will neither rain nor do for the next few years except at my command. Now, it wasn't just that Elijah was in a bad mood that day. He was responding to, if you wish, the apostasy of backslidden Israel and its leader, Ahab, and the house of Ahab. Everything that was opposed to God, it seemed like Ahab was intent on doing. And so God was bringing, if you wish, judgment in this particular moment. And for three and a half years, we find in Scripture, it didn't rain. Now, if it doesn't rain, certain things happen. There's a trickle effect. If there's no rain, it means that there is no agriculture. If there's no agriculture, there's no food. If there's no food, people are hungry. If people get hungry, they starve, they die, the economy is wrecked. And when things like that happen, people invariably point to the people in charge. So you can imagine this has been a very intense three and a half year period of time. And we pick up our story in the next chapter of 1 Kings, and we see an encounter with this king, King Ahab. And Elijah. And they have a contest, if you wish. And Ahab brings his prophets. And he has his prophets pray to, quote, their gods that it might rain. Nothing happens. But then Elijah builds an altar according to God's specifications. And he begins to pray. And he says this prayer. He says, God, let it be known today that I am your servant. I've done all these things at your command. And that you are turning the hearts of the people back to you. That's an amazing prayer. I don't know about you, but in a moment like that, I would have been praying for my own preservation. God, don't make me look bad. Because these people, they're tired, they're hungry. These prophets of Baal that have been dancing for the last however many hours, calling out to gods that aren't there, they're, they're going to kill me. I mean, I would have been saying, God, make me look good. That was not Elijah's prayer. It was, God, draw these people to you. And as soon as Elijah prayed that prayer, it says that fire fell from heaven, consumed the sacrifice and the altar. And guess what happened? It says the people fell down on their face, declaring the Lord, he is God. I guess so. But then an amazing thing happens. Elijah says this, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. Now for three and a half years, there's been no indication whatsoever of rain. But now Elijah is hearing something for the first time in three and a half years. And he says he climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. And he told Ahab, he said, you go eat and drink. But what did Elijah do? It says he began to pray. It says he crouched down, and that's a, that, that's a picture of birthing. But he was praying, and he kept, he kept praying. He kept sending his servant back, looking out over the sea. But the first time, nothing. Second time, fourth time, sixth time, nothing. How many times do we hear something? Do we get a promise from God, whether it's out of the Bible or maybe some, something that God quickens to us and we know God has spoken, we hear it, but we haven't seen it yet. Some of us stop praying after the second time or the third time. We just assume that one, we either heard wrong or God's a liar. But Elijah keeps praying until what he's heard begins to match what he's now seen. And the seventh time, he says, the servant came back. He says, I see a small cloud coming up out of the ocean. And then Elijah knew what he'd heard was getting ready to correspond to what he was about to see. Hear me. Rain is falling. I showed you the picture. We're not prophesying anymore. We're reporting the news. Rain is falling. That which many have heard for generations, 
decades have been waiting for this moment, and yet you and I, God has chosen to steward what He is about to do on the planet. He wants to use you and me. Why? I don't know. I look in the mirror every morning just like you, and I'm like, why us? I'm sure that Israel probably thought what the generation that finally crossed over into promise. Why us? But God has chosen you and me this hour to steward this outpouring. But I want to contrast some things here for us this morning. That if we, if we, if you say, okay, Pastor Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. That we are in a unique moment of God. I, I haven't seen it for myself, but I'll take your word for it. Then it begs a question, what do we do? What do we do when God begins to move? We need look no further than the contrast between Ahab and Elijah. It's interesting that in this moment that God is about to release rain back on the earth, he tells Ahab, you go eat and drink. And then rain begins to fall. And he sends another message to Ahab. Hitch up your chariot, and you need to head back to Jezreel, where he came from, before the rain stops you. Hang on to that thought. But it says, in the meantime, it says, Elijah tucked his cloak into his belt, and it says, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, let me give you some context here, because there's a race here in Ghent today. I don't know how long it is, but the distance from Carmel to Jezreel is 25 miles. 25 miles. Roughly the distance of a modern marathon. And we see in the power of the Spirit, it says that Elijah ran the entire way. The first point I want to draw out is a contrasting Ahab and Elijah. Ahab rode, Elijah ran. And if you need a title for this message, you can call it Running in the Rain. You see, we know from Scripture that we walk by faith. You ever heard that passage? We walk by faith faith and that's absolutely true but let me just add something to that we run by the spirit because when god begins to come everything begins to accelerate those things in your life that have been held back they've been in delay sometimes they've even been delayed demonically let me tell you, when the reign of God comes, everything begins to shift and everything begins to come in the moments of acceleration. These campus ministers that have been laboring on these campuses, they weren't all of a sudden better campus ministers. They didn't have a different methodology or a different me a message to preach. They were doing the same things that they had been doing year after year after year. But all of a sudden, when the reign of God came, it accelerated, it amplified everything they had been doing up to that period of time. Many times we think, well, everything around my life is going to change. I'm going to have... No, not necessarily. Is that God is going to, again, accelerate. Take that which you have and do more with it. Hear me. But Ahab wrote. You know, it's an interesting thing about chariots. Is that they are uniquely man-made. Chariots are pulled by horses that are trained to respond to the command of men. The horse and the chariot have to travel on a road that has been designed and built by a man. Roads start in one place 
They have a destination. They end in another place, once again, designed and built by men. Man-made. And you and I, ladies and gentlemen, in our own lives, listen to me, we've become excellent chariot drivers. Our own way, our own design, our own destination, rather than God's. It's fascinating. And it's interesting that Elijah told Ahab, you need to actually go ahead before the rain stops you. Do you realize that when the rain comes, is that those things that are uniquely of man-designed, man-made, that the rain will actually hinder those things? Very interesting. And yet those things that are of God, that are of the Spirit, God is going to energize in a way that we've rarely seen before. An author wrote this. He said, where there is the necessary technical skill to move mountains, there's no need for the faith that moves those mountains. Isn't that the truth? How many times when we say to God, God, I got it. God says, well, go get it. God just steps off and leaves us to our own what? Our own devices, our own design, our own power, which is really no power at all. In the United States, there's this really terrible country song called Jesus Take the Wheel. Stupid song. Jesus Take the Wheel. And folks say, oh, look, you know, the, the influence of the church on country music. And, you know, people think, oh, that's just a wonderful song. I'm thinking it's the dumbest song in the whole world. Jesus Take the Wheel. You know, we're happy to give Jesus the steering wheel of our life, once we're all of a sudden, there's cars coming at us, we're veering off into the ditch, and you're, ah! take the wheel. But the implication of Jesus taking the wheel is that Jesus was never driving to begin with. You were. And I've noticed something about walking with God for almost 50 years, is that God never competes. Hello? He never competes. You know, competition is something that's unique to the human condition. But when you are the sovereign, when you're God, when you've made it all, when it all belongs to you, when there's nothing else that's even close, you don't have to compete. God doesn't have all those insecurities that come with competition because he's God. And likewise, God will never compete for time, space, affection in your life and mine. He'll just let us take the wheel of our own lives. And in revival, it becomes even more critical that we do that which God has called us to do, His way. Many years ago, my wife and I were pastoring a church in another state, in the United States, and we had a couple in our church, and the wife developed cancer. And she prayed, and her husband, and the church, and we stood. And I'll never forget this Sunday that she stood up in front of the church and testified that she was cancer-free. It was an amazing moment. But as often happens when people get a diagnosis like this, she and her husband begin to eat very healthy. So there were no more brownies or donuts or McDonald's, but they begin to juice carrots. Prodigious amounts of carrots, like 20 pounds a day. What's that like, I don't know, 10 kilograms? Like 10, 10, 10 kilograms of carrots a day, shoving it in their Vitamix. Now, if you tried to eat that many carrots, you would develop jaw problems real fast. But they were juicing all of these carrots. And it's an amazing thing that when you drink that much carrot juice every day, you are melanin challenged, meaning light complected. You turn orange. And these precious people turn orange. They look like cartoon characters. They look like you needed to adjust your television because their hue was wrong, so to speak. 
And she got up and these precious orange people were testifying about being cancer free. But it was sort of a, a dual billing, sort of dual uh, uh, acknowledgement and glory between Jesus and the wonders of beta carotene. And I had an opportunity to chat with him the following week. And I said, you really need to decide in your testimony whether or not Bugs Bunny healed you or Jesus Christ healed you. Now, listen, I believe that God uses it all. I'm not saying not to take care of yourself. I believe God uses doctors. God made the carrot and the beta carotene, and it has certain ways that it interacts and reacts with the body. But it's still of divine design. Are you with me? God was still doing the work. But in this particular moment, it was this sort of, well, which is it? And you and I live our lives many times in this same sort of bifurcated place. What do I mean by that? Is that it's our own design, our own chariot, but yet it's God's way. And we live in this conundrum. We live in this conflict in, our, in ourselves. We love God, we want to follow God, but then there's the McDonald's. There's whatever is in front of us. There's this great idea that I have for my life that may have nothing to do with the plans that God has for your life. Amazing. Joshua chapter 3, giving orders to the people. They, this generation chosen to finally cross over and pass into their inheritance. And he gives them this command. He says, don't move. Until you see the priest and the ark of the covenant that the priests are carrying. The ark representing God, the presence of God. Why? Because we've never been this way before. I mean, here is a culminating moment of generations. It seems to be a very simple thing. We go from here to here. We cross this Jordan River and we come into that which God has promised. But he says, don't move until you see the ark before you. And in this hour, ladies and gentlemen, it becomes ever more critical that we don't move until we see and hear that which God is doing and saying in this moment. Why? Because we've never been this way before. My wife and I have been walking with God for a while. I came into the, got, got saved as a college freshman, came into the charismatic renewal of the 1970s. The 1990s was another unique outpouring of the Spirit of God. Here we are now in 2023, but I can tell you that what we experienced in the 70s and the 90s, as wonderful as it was, was not necessarily preparatory or even a template for that which God is doing in this particular moment. One author said it this way. He said, you can never get back into Narnia the same way twice. You got through the wardrobe once, it won't happen again. And so while we can look back at historical revivals and say, well, this is how God's going to do it, while it might be a bit helpful, it's not going to take us the entire way until we see that which God is doing. Another theologian said it this way. He said, we never say never and never say always. And when you think you've got God figured out, remember that. All right? Never say never and never say always. The rain is falling. But there's another aspect to this that makes this a little bit complicated. Is that with this rain comes unique resistance. And I have to tell you that I completely missed this. I really did. Somehow I thought that the devil, the enemy, would just step back and just say, oh, revival, all right, go ahead. You, you, you can have that. I had no idea how hard the devil would push back. I was shocked. I started preaching some of these messages almost two years ago. 
And what my wife and I have been through, what we've experienced, not in our marriage, but what we've experienced around our lives, what we've seen, things people going through, we've never quite seen the enemy quite as active and activated and worried as we're seeing in this particular moment. And there's been amazing pushback and resistance. Because with this amazing openness in the heavenlies, the amazing opportunities that it opens for us here on earth, the opposition that comes with it is fierce. Elijah, back to our story. He's run all the way back to Jezreel. God has done this incredible thing. But there's a little lady waiting for him in Jezreel. Ahab's wife, Jezebel. Now, Jezebel's bad lady, let me just tell you, for all kinds of reasons. But she sends this message to Elijah. Now, we're not talking about a seven- or eight-year-old school child. We're talking about the prophet Elijah that has authority over weather. And, a, and Jezebel sends a little message to him. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to make your life like one of those prophets that you killed at Mount Carmel. And our man, our man Elijah, he's been running. Power of the Spirit. The pinnacle of his entire life. And Jezebel sends this threat. And it says he feared for his life and he ran. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you, if the enemy could get, Je get Elijah to run for his life, let me tell you, the devil can probably say boo and get you to start running as well. I think Elijah might be made out of quite, I, I know what the Bible said about Je James, a man just like, a, let me tell you, if Jezebel could get Elijah to run, I got a feeling the devil can get you and I, our attention as well. And it says he was so fearful. It says he ran into the wilderness, left his servant behind, and traveled a day. Let me say one thing about that. When you start getting pursued like that, don't leave your friends behind. Take them with you. But he ran into the desert. And he laid down and he said, God, kill me. And this was not... A child that didn't get dessert. <laughs> this was a man that walked with God with enough intimacy. And he was so broken that he wanted his life to end. An angel came. Gave him some water, some bread. He ate, fell back asleep. Angel came a second time. Another loaf of bread, another jar of water. And it says in Scripture, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Wow. Now, I don't know what was in that second loaf of bread, but that was some, that's, that's some serious bread. Let me just tell you. But you see, there were two meals. And what's interesting here is that that first meal is what sustained his life and dealt with the disappointments and discouragement of his past. It was the second meal that prepared him for his future and his destiny. You see, many of us, we want to talk about the future. Talk to me about my destiny. Talk to me about the great things coming up. And God's got some wonderful things for us. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. But let me tell you, many of us, we cannot eat that second meal of moving forward until we've eaten that first meal that we've dealt with the disillusionments and the failures of our past. Jesus established something called the table, Eucharist, communion. This is my body. This is my blood. You see, that dealt with the past. It covered it. 
And you see, the enemy loves to try to uncover those things that God has already covered. Those things that have already been dealt with by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, put under the blood, and the Bible says that God has forgotten. Because what? Love does not keep a record. God forgets. That's amazing. And yet the enemy is faithful to continue to uncover and dig back up and say, not really. That first meal deals with all of those disillusionments and disappointments from our past. And I see so many Christians, oh, Pastor Jim, give me a word for my future. But yet they're still dragging around all of this stuff. They've not eaten the first meal, so they can't really eat and partake of the second one yet. God provided two for the prophet Elijah in this particular moment. My last point this morning is rain reveals. You know, when rain comes, it washes things off. You ever gone in your car and your windshield has got all this stuff on it and you get this heavy downpour of rain and all of a sudden it's like, whew, I can see again. Rain reveals what's always been there. As I've gotten older, I've had to create a theology that I can carry into my old age because my brain's a little leaky these days. And I'm not as smart as this, all these folks going to seminary now and you know reading the Bible in original languages. God bless them. I'm, just, that's, I'm not that guy. I'll never be that guy. I've given up on being smart. All right. But I've developed a theology of the primary ways that the enemy likes to work. We know from John that he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. It's true. But there's a unique way that he does that. And I believe that one of the primary methodologies of the devil is to simply obscure or try to hide the God who's always been there. You see, one of, the, one of the great challenges for us when we go through a trial, when we go through trouble, when we have trauma, is that God abandoned me. He wasn't there. If he'd been there, then this thing would never have happened in my life. That becomes the big lie. It's why in the gospel, Matthew 28, we quote the first part of it all the time, making disciples of all nations and baptizing them. But we fail to, re to finish the entire passage. And behold, come on, I will be with you, say with you, to the very end of the age. I will never leave you nor abandon you. Jesus was so intent on this relationship, on him being with us, omnipresent with us all the time. He moved his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you and me. And yet the devil will say, God's not there. God doesn't care. He didn't care when that terrible thing happened to you when you were a child. He didn't care when that loved one died and God did not raise him up. God disappeared. And the enemy does everything he can to obscure the God who's there. He works overtime. And reign of revival, it reveals who this God is to us in ways we've never experienced before. Some of you are about to step into some of the richest encounters with God you've ever had in your entire life. God is going to break through because he's a breakthrough God. He's going to speak. He's going to show you things. You're going to see things in your imagination. You're going to begin to have dreams. And it's not just going to be your imagination or too much pizza too late. It's going to be God speaking to you. Hear me. 
But this revelation has two parts. Yes, God's going to come and reveal himself. But he's also going to reveal you to you. This is the less fun part of this. And this is where we can look back at the history of revivals because there's always been an emphasis on holiness. You see, we get a glimpse of what's really on the inside. I remember years ago, there was this very public crime that happened in this very evil individual, and I was so happy with myself, and I said, oh God, I just thank you that I'm not that person. You ever had a stupid prayer like, oh God, I've never killed anybody. God, thank you, I'm not Adolf Hitler. Woo! And the Lord just said, son, he said, everything that's in him is in you. And the only thing that keeps it from coming out is me. Said, Whoa. Isaiah, the ninth chapter. I've seen God, and I'm ruined because I'm an unclean man, unclean lips around unclean people. Paul, Romans, the seventh chapter. Everything I want to do, I don't. And everything I don't want to do, I do. And who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? My goodness. Paul, the author and architect of grace in the New Covenant, the New Testament. How did he, how did he come to that revelation? Because God had shown him him. That's never a happy revelation, ladies and gentlemen. Because we realize how deep the abyss of our own condition truly is. But here's the wonderful news. is that we have the privilege of apprehending grace at a whole new measure when we embrace that revelation of self. We don't let it condemn us and bury us. But we always get to say, but Jesus, but Jesus has covered every one of those sins, not just of commission, but of omission. Those things that are not just in, in our actions, but in our motivations and our attitudes. It's all covered by the precious blood. And revival begins to show us these things. Our little church. In North Carolina, we had this August where people began to weep and cry. They were on the floor. Talk about an unfriendly guest environment. But a spirit of conviction to come with that little church. And people were crying out to God. And then in September, the next month, God's power fell on our little church. Power, signs, wonders. People were falling down in the Holy Spirit. They were run. It was an amazing, it was a mess, but it was glorious. But what preceded that was a deep spirit of conviction that fell on that church. What have I said this morning? It's raining. It's raining. The question now is, what do we do? First of all, we stop writing. We stop writing in someone else's relationship. Stop writing in somebody else's Bible study. Stop writing in somebody else's intercession. And we start running in the Spirit. Running. And should we not surprised at the resistance that comes? The confusion, the conundrum, the convergence of this opposition, this unusual opposition coming with this amazing openness in the heavens. It's still God doing both. Hear me. Jesus said, take heart, I have overcome the world. But then lastly, revelation's coming. God's about to reveal himself to his people in ways we've never experienced before. And it's going to come with a revelation some things in your life he's about to put his finger on, but it's okay.
because of his abounding love and his amazing love. Pray with me. Lord, as Pastor Tabita said earlier this morning, we can listen or we can hear. We can listen with our natural ears and our carnal minds, or we can hear something with our spirits. And Lord, I'm praying this morning for hearing, spiritual hearing. God, let us be renewed, transformed in this hour. God, let us not miss a single drop of that which you are pouring out. And, Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us in this moment, in this generation, to steward this outpouring. Lord, use us. We're here. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Jim. This is our desire, right? Let me ask that again. This is our desire, right? We're not just here to fill our Sunday morning. We're here because we are thirsty and we are hungry for God. And there's a world out there that is desperate to meet a deep to meeting. Yeah? And the only way how he's gonna meet uh, him is through us. And I that was so encouraging to Jim. It's really just so good to hear, right? It's really good to hear. So I just I just need to pray as well. Just pray as well. Just maybe stand up already and stretch out your hands if this is what you want. And guys, it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be seven, or I don't know how old you are, so. Or you can be 82 or more. It doesn't matter. Okay? And it's not about us. It's about God. So even if we start singing just after I've prayed, I want you to think about God. I want you to... Change the focus from us to God. Father, I just, we are here for one sole thing, and that is to honor you. We are here not to, to ask you to, to be like the horses in our own made chariots. We are here to leave all those man-made chariots behind. And we do know, God, our own hearts that are so easy in just going to those man-made things. And God, we, we want to repent from that. But even with that, God, we pray for godly sorrow in our hearts and godly repentance. And God, we want to stretch out our hands and say, like, God, we need you. We want to honor you and we want to worship you. And we don't want to miss this revival. Not because um, we think it's going to cost us too much or not because we're, we're so busy with our own man-made things or not because we're, we're just not interesting. God, we are here because we want to step in whatever you have for this place and for the places we are called to whether we are in college, whether we are in university, whether we are in the workplace, whether we are at elementary school or high school. God, will you touch and make us vehicles of just bringing your reign in all of those different places. God, let us be landing places for your spirit and for you. God, let our lives be so attracted, attractive to you because we aligned our whole being to, to you. And it's no longer about you serving us, what so easily creeps into in our lives, but it's about our wholehearted devotion to you. And 
guys just realize this is a dangerous prayer. If you agree with us, this is not just like a, a like, oh, it feels like prayer. If this is your prayer, then pray it knowing that it will cost you all. Jesus says, unless you die, you can only then just bear fruit that pleases. Are we willing to die of our own man-made plans and surrender it all to find ourselves with Jesus? Are we willing to lay down our own desires, our own costs? Jesus, help us. So Jesus, yes, we want that. If that's you, just, just pray that in your own language, in your own 